Yellow Telescopes to Yellow Telecast, the best practices for the best practices, providing the medical industry's best practices to the medical industry's best practices since 2008. Are you a doctor? Do you work for a doctor? Do you want to earn more, be more efficient, retain your team, hire for success, or just want to have a better lifestyle? I bet you do. What should you expect from the podcast? A lighthearted, casual, fun, hopefully funny, informative, impactful, well-founded look at the medical industry from a pair of a passionate, competent, confident, experienced, talented, questionably good-looking, unquestionably good-looking industry leaders, men of the renaissance, if you will, and even if you won't, who enjoy scotch whiskey, world travel, music, single malt scotch whiskey, fine dining, not fine dining, family art, and Ryan Bourbon whiskeys while implementing intensive training and expert staffing, resulting in unparalleled growth. Listen to the podcast and for more on how Yellow Telescope can help you grow, visit yellowtelescope.com for upcoming events, published articles, recorded speeches, past issues of our complimentary email newsletter, testimonials, and more. We're back. It's a real pleasure to see Ed. Great to see you as well, John. We work together all the time, but I have not seen that mug in the better part of a month. Uh Uh-huh. That's right. Yeah, so we finished up the uh, Vegas Cosmetic Surgery and Dermatology meeting, the symposium, Uh and I believe it was June 10th. Yep. And I flew directly to where we are today. That's right. Where are we, John? I'm unsure. Well, and thank I thank you for finding me. <laughs> of course, it was tough. What with the lack of complete reception here, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we are excited to uh, be recording. What is this? Twenty one. We can never remember. I, think I believe we're... this is episode twenty one of the podcast. Yep. And uh, yeah, we're here, coming to you live and recorded, uh, per usual. Uh, here from the fabulous Bridgehampton. It's it's very exciting. So a couple hours outside of New York City, out in our favorite little hamlet Mm -hmm. of Bridgehampton. Been enjoying uh, Fourth of July festivities. Went out to Montauk for some fireworks with the child. Absolutely. And Unky Ed. Unky Ed was there. Oh, it was a blast. Uh, Enjoying some live music at the Surf Lodge. Rocked out that pure pure Prairie League at uh, at Stephen Talk House. Uh huh. Uh, Amy, what What you you gonna gonna do? Yep. That's, so, that's as good as it gets for us. Yeah, they're, Thank you. They, they're still humming. We're barely singing these days. So it's been a nice, <laughs> relaxing, fun. You know, normally this is the point in the podcast we do some sort of it's hot as heck in yeah. Florida joke. It's so humid that. It's so hot that. But you know what? Can't. Weather's been resplendent. Yeah, indeed. Just absolute chamber of commerce days. Oh, yeah. I mean, just take in the expansive, resplendent lawns that are the Hamptons That's that right. exude and present themselves behind us. Dewy grasses. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been about 70, 75, 80, perfect every day. Spent a lot of time at the beach. Yep. And so we decided just to talk a little bit more about beards. That's right, because apparently, uh, after having not seen each other, per usual, we're on the same page, melding into the same human the older we get, and and showed up with just really full beards. It's a lot of this. It's a summer beard. Trying to comb it now. Just trying to learn how to manage it. Scraggly. I think you're better looking with the beard. Thank you. Um, it's, I need all the help I can get. That's for yeah, sure. really. With me, I use it mostly to cover up the face. Uh huh. Yeah. Working with too many facial plastics experts. You know, <laughs> just too much focus. I got to provide some structure. What with That's all right. the barbecues and you know <laughs> things like that. It's just looking a little Been soft. Been marinating around. some chicken thighs to say the least. And of course, I've sampled a few whiskeys. Uh, While well, we've been here, we which did, we'll we be did. talking about. I'm going to be pouring one right now, actually. Um, um, but speaking be- of beards, yeah. by the way, uh, it's interesting. We, we did a little bit of research uh, and found uh, that a study showed that uh, people perceive bearded men uh, as 51% less cheerful than clean shaven men. Mm, but anyone sort of sad, sort of nonplussed. In- indeed. Negative, uh, pensive, overly sad and thoughtful. But anyone able to grow a full beard knows just how happy of a feat that can be. Isn't it true? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I, you know, why do you have one? Because I can? Yeah. I mean, take Abraham Lincoln. That's right. He, after winning the war, uh, grew the beard out even longer, uh-huh. simply because a young girl wrote him a letter asking him to do so. Saying, you would look better with a beard. Superb advice. Unfortunately, she had absolutely nothing to say about theaters. Let's go ahead and pour that whiskey. Yes. Out. On that note... Now, we've got some really special expressions. It had to be done. Yep. We have to give a special shout out to our good friend Ross who curated the summer tasting menu here at Casa Shea Hoff. That's right. Chateau Hoff. That's right. We have two selections today, which is a rarity, but we couldn't pass them up. And we would have had six, but over the course of, I think, 14 visitors in six weeks or something, or yeah. four weeks we've been here, the rest are gone. So we knocked out the Russell Reserve single barrel. We've taken great care of an old Putney 12. Mm-hmm. We've 
um, made good work of an Old Scout 10 and a hand-selected lock and key Old Scout 11. Yep, as well as an Angel's Envy Rye. That's right. And we even have a bottle, which shan't be shown on camera, of the California Gold that shall remain nameless. But we do have two expressions to share with you. Now, I'll let you know, I don't pretend to be a bourbon and rye expert, although I'm willing to sip them when poured in my glass on yeah. occasion, on vacation, sure. on a vacation occasion. Right. Particularly on, you know, America's birthday. Uh, drink, correct. Drink America. It seems right. So we wanted to go Kentucky this time, change it up from our typical single malt scotch. And we have such an, a resplendent selection that to not sample them on camera would be doing you, the viewer, the listener in podcast land and or YouTube land, a disservice. That's right. So first, uh, we're going to go with the most obscure of the two, which is the J. Mattingly uh, bourbon. This is one of just 25 bottles of this anywhere in the world. We have bottle 19. So you're not going to probably find this one, but you can find other expressions of Jay Mattingly and purchase things from Bourbon 30. Now, very, very controversial bottle here, Ed. Uh -huh. First of all, as with almost everything we taste, we have rocket fuel at 110 proof, 55%. Right. So we have a little bit of water right here yep. uh, just to open that up a little bit to take it a little easy. And this is the Keenon Spring. So we do a bunch of little limited editions and so on. One of the fun things about the Bourbon 30 distillery is you can actually go there and sort of select and blend your own mix, which mm -hmm. is really cool. And so the master blender is Jay, I believe, Jeff Mattingly. Uh, however, uh, I believe it's named not so much for him as much as the founder, J. John Graves, mm -hmm. Mattingly. Uh, why, you ask, is this uh, questionable or disputed? Well, they got a bad rap for sort of possibly rumors, strange things going around. They're distilling things in old garbage cans, all kinds of madness. They're using only cheap <laughs> whiskey. I tend to think it's rumor because this particular bottle is what I would describe as nectar. Yeah. Would you like to try it? Indeed. Cheers. Mm. Mm. And it takes that long to swallow it because it's so strong. Mm -hmm. Really, really good. You do get uh, a little bit of the barley mm -hmm. notes. Um, obviously some vanilla. Yeah, I would definitely go. It is spicy. It's really spicy on the end, on the end, but um, definitely um, some some caramel. Yeah. Some vanilla, some spice. Mm -hmm. But that'll that'll kind of soften up with just a touch of water, which we'll be doing to, to both of our selections today. Thank you so much. Got that corn whiskey. Oh yeah. Oh, this is a terrible pour. That's fine. It is distilled water though about what you want. Well, that might even be too much, but we did it. Our second bottle, which we'll just introduce now, is something that we actually gave away a bottle of. That's right. Um, uh, at our most recent meeting, I believe it was at ASAPS. ASAPS. A few weeks ago. Uh -huh. And uh, it took us the whole time to give it away ASAPS. Uh, this, which was won by a tiny doctor mm -hmm. from somewhere in Fayetteville. Uh-huh. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, she was a lovely woman who I don't think drinks whiskey, but I think she said she was giving it to her husband. Absolutely, who is actually a, 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 purportedly a uh, quite an aficionado. Indeed. So what we have here is the George T. Stag. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a findable, unfindable whiskey, which means you can find it kind of in the aftermarket every now and then if you go to any liquor store and ask behind the counter if they have a secret bottle. Very limited allotments. Um, we found one in the state of Louisiana by basically negotiating with a restaurant yep. um, and getting their very last bottle to be sold to us. Um, this bottle um, we sourced elsewhere. When we talk about rocket fuel, this is Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. This is 64.6% .6 booze, which means it's 129 proof, which means it's strong. Yet as you'll taste it, arguably it goes down a little smoother than the J-Mat. It's right. Which is why it's about four times the price. So you're uh -huh. gonna run into this bottle for somewhere in the uh, $599 to $1,000 range. So it's one of the fancier bottles that we feature, even though we oftentimes have the old 30, 40, 50, $60 uh, bottle of roux. Right. So this is really, really unbelievable, incredible, delicious, tasty nectar. Every year, obviously, they have a little slight variation of the particular barrels they're selecting and what you get. Um, but it's rocket fuel needs a little bit of bur a little bit of a <laughs> the bourbon needs a little bit of bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> just, just just to smooth it out, make a blend. Uh -huh. um, 
Yeah, don't blend this. Don't make a uh, an old fashioned out of it. That would be blasphemous. Yeah, please don't. Um, but uh, but this is great, great stuff, and one of our favorite bottles. So we gave one away. We figured let's just go ahead and open one as well. <laughs> yeah. So go ahead and get you one. Um, and better yet, if you find any of these bottles, simply purchase them, throw them in your cellar. Unlike wine that have to be stored at a particular temperature, at least not within reason. They don't age once they're in the bottle, at least presumably. Right. And pretty much you sell them in five years for a whole lot more than you paid for them. So you're welcome. It's us helping you make money through investment ideas. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, there is an actual full whiskey exchange online. Oh, for sure. Um, no, they're mm -hmm. traded and the value oh, yeah. fluctuates based on supply and demand. Indeed. Um, it's kind of fun to watch, uh, if nothing else, even if you're not into it. It's just like what your kids are doing these days with the Air Jordans. Exactly right. StockX. Well, should we teach something or do something today? I know we're talking marketing. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we've actually been, uh, per usual, uh, discussing a lot about what we've been finding uh, among our clients. What, what are, what are the uh, st state of the union, state, state of the industry? Uh, we've been talking a lot about staffing. We've talked a lot about planning. Um, of course, a lot of that still is ongoing. And, uh, of course, you know, encountering those unique challenges in such a strong job market. But... One of the things it's we only the best in fifty one years now. That's right. Incredible. That's incredible. Right. What's interesting is you know who has a job? Everyone. All of them. Literally every single person. Some college, ninety eight percent. Yeah. Everyone's got a job. Yeah. If you so, graduated college, you're under two percent. Now it's still tough out there for some, no yep. question. But not most of the people we're hiring for most of the jobs that we're filling. Right. Yeah. Uh, everyone's looking for a better opportunity, and of course, we're always going to be focusing specifically on growing the business, growing the practice. Uh, of course, several ways to do that. One, of course, have the best people. Of course, have the best processes to be able to maximize the conversion of all the leads you're already getting, both internal and external marketing. But then, of course, we got to get the leads in the door. Once you've got the right people and the right processes, we got to get the leads. Hence, the creation of SE Oversight, uh, and uh, hence our management of the marketing for many, many, many clients across North America and internationally. Uh, with that said, uh, we've been ruminating a bit about some of the challenges that our clients have been seeing, what with the current marketing landscape, particularly with some Google updates and other things, and how it's affecting other lead sources, et cetera. But we kind of wanted to speak to what to do and what the uh, landscape's going to be looking like throughout the rest of the year. Yeah, it's sort of like we're just like an e news show, um, only okay. instead of fashion trends. Right. It's all about what's happening in the world of medicine. Right. Which Only incidentally nothing to do with medicine. <laughs> and everything to do with the world of business medicine, which happens to be probably the same as the world of business. Mm -hmm. Because pretty much I think most businesses are going through about the same things and different variations. Um, at least most small businesses go through the same things generally throughout the course of an economic cycle, of which this one will never end. It's already the longest in American history and recorded history uh, of, of the Americas. I don't know about the Americas, but at least one America, the United States of. Sure. So things are going theoretically pretty well, at least in terms of overall economic growth. Uh, folks who are running medical practice for the most part are making money. But one of the trends that I've really seen among um, not so much all of my clients, but just Doctors in general that we're speaking with practices. Uh, we just came back from ASAS, just came back from Vegas Cosmetic Surgery and speaking a lot and uh, encountering a lot of human beings. And for the first time, uh, and I'm not sure if it's a canary in the coal mine, um, uh, but for the first time in about 10 years, I am seeing people and doctors sort of peak in terms of overall lead counts. Yep. Um, their processes remain generally inefficient. Most still have never hired a consultant, have never invested a single dollar in people training, yep. uh, not one dollar. A uh, few have maybe sent their people to a meeting. Um, but the vast majority of them still have those same general issues that started Yellow Telescope, which basically is help get those leads that are already existing, like you said, in the door, booking at a high percentage rate with high efficiency, cross sell, upsell rates, an ethical environment that creates referral business and repeat business and cross selling business in a wonderful, positive way with great five star service reviews. That sort of the leads already here through the moment of sale and beyond, that process remains pretty much broken and I'd say 95% of medical practices nationally. Some are doing better. I mm -hmm. think that there's more of a trend towards starting the concept of investing in people and starting the concept of consulting and so forth. What I found though for the first time in about 10 years though, is that most doctors, even if they were fairly poor at marketing or didn't invest a lot or it wasn't their forte or even just what they wanted to spend their money on, were sort of slowly grinding up the hill mm -hmm. in terms of lead counts month over month, year over year, even if they maybe weren't the most sophisticated. And for the first time, I'm having more and more doctors come to me and say, my leads have simply dried up. I don't know what's happening, but I'm getting less calls. 
Uh, and so that brings kind of the question marks up with us, which is, is this due to competition? Certainly there is no question in the aesthetic realm, there is massive amounts more uh, competition than even three or four years ago, which means local strip malls that open up pseudo med spas, uh, more and more people that are able to inject or do laser treatments, changes in the laws making it more difficult to attract nurse injectors and PAs. We're starting to, we've staffed several of these positions lately. Right. So if you're struggling for nurse injectors, uh, PAs, even doctors, this is one of the things we've become specialists in just because of necessity. Um, so is it that that's the issue? Is it that marketing has shifted and people no longer shop in the way that they used to? Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is I think a, a, quite a bit of research starting with you know uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of long-term clients and hundreds and hundreds of SE oversight um, and ice cream social media clients right. and kind of see what's working and sort of what's not. Mm -hmm. So as a sort of long-winded precursor, that's kind of what I talk about. It's not just trends in general, which is, oh, people are getting more non-invasive treatments. We know that's growing, but if non-invasive treatments are growing by 15 to 17% per year, which is about the clip I believe that Allergan told us a couple years ago, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if the number of providers are growing by 96% per year. Right. That's still a net decrease per location. What, what our sense is, at least initially, is that it isn't so much a question of competition. Um, people, since I started in this industry, I said, oh, there's more and more competition, but there is also more and more buyers, mm -hmm. and the economy gets better and better and better, at least relative to, say, 2008. Sure. Uh, and the big crash. So uh, we don't really sense that it's competition per se. Um, what we are finding is that marketing is shifting. Mm -hmm. um, now we all know the interweb exists. I'm not sure if you're familiar. The www's the dub the, the World Wide Web Webster uh, Dictionary World the inter, the Wicca the the, the Wiccanet the, the gog goggle Yahoo. goggle yeah goggle mostly Yahoo. Um, so we are still seeing that all of those things still work. If sure. you don't have a website, then gosh, call SE Oversight yeah. immediately. My uh, goodness. Just, um, if your website isn't ranking for a number of terms on page one of Google, maybe not all of them, but if you're in a decent sized market, you know, one or two, and if you're in a large, you know, small market for almost everything, call us. Mm -hmm. um, but most doctors now have some sort of ongoing monthly web marketing fee that they're paying to a professional team who usually stinks, but could be good. Yep. Uh, most have a website that's sort of passable. And we know one of the trends is that people are discerning more among which websites will convert or which ones they're willing to call or email. Um, what they're lacking is some of the more advanced marketing techniques that are kind of coming to the forefront. So I want to talk a little bit about those. Yeah, and also I think being nimble enough to adapt to the changing landscape, whether it's their existing team or their internal team, uh, to make sure that they can actually shift things to go along with some of the changes in algorithms and some of the changing landscapes and, yeah, and, so and consumer behavior. Exactly. So you mentioned algorithms. So let's take a quick step backwards. We talked about... Um, uh, website and the way it looks. Mm -hmm. One of the trends we've seen, which has nothing to do with the algorithms, and we may have talked about this a couple of podcasts back, but if not in one of the speeches that I, that I gave this summer, um, uh, or I guess this spring, if you will, and, and honestly, you know, even if you want, uh, is that, of course, the idea of having a more beautiful website really started to trend about five or six years ago, not just having something that had information about the doctor and had some before and after photos, but something that was really beautifully, gorgeously showcased. Yep. That trend has evolved even further now to incorporate the need for professional photo shoots, which can be offered by a really good online marketing team, a sure. good web, web agency, and if not, can be hired locally if you find just the right team, kind of buyer beware, they really have to understand internet photography exactly. and what's going to look good. Not just a professional photographer you know, that comes in that does weddings and other portraiture and whatnot and you know, can take wonderful headshots, but really framing the photos to be able to showcase the doctor, the, the, the team, the entire practice, the facilities correctly so that it's going to be formatted properly on a website. Exactly. And it's, it's, you know, different groups have different things in common. For example, boxers and wedding photographers both are great at taking headshots. N neither good at wedding photography. Um, web agencies with professional photographers or people who photograph for television or print tend to be a little bit better with that. But again, just contact us and we'll help you find somebody good and that help will be free. Yep. Um, that's something that's just something we've, we have the data to show, which you wouldn't be able to test. It just shows that our conversion percentages when the website goes live with better photography simply improves. For some websites, a quarter of a percent, others that it's a percent or two. And when you think about 5,000 visitors to a website or 1,000 visitors to a website with even a 2% conversion rate, it's a difference between 20 leads and 25 leads a month. Yep. Or, you know, 
a hundred leads and 125 a month. It's a huge, massive difference just based on photography. So that's a little tip, but it really has nothing to do with algorithms. Right. And nothing to do with the trends in marketing and the way that technology is dovetailing with it. What we're seeing online through all of our SE oversight clients is that for the first time in about three or four years, which is when we had a huge influx of new clients coming to us just saying, help me, everything's broken. We're seeing the average web team get a little bit better. A few of the worst people have been weeded out, but most of the bad guys remain. Um, most web teams in our industry have between 25 and 400 different medical clients, and still 80 or 90% of them, not only do we not endorse, but we think are literally, basically providing a service that is worth somewhat to significantly less than what they're charging. Yeah. And then out of that remaining small percentage that deliver a fairly good quality result and product, we're finding that they are running into trouble right now because of algorithmic changes. Um, generally, we all know that Google is an algorithm. We all know that it is constantly changing every single minute of every single day. There's some new code, some little changes. And we know their ultimate goal is pretty logical, which is to deliver the very best results in the minimum amount of time for anyone searching for anything on earth ever. Right. And to do that in aggregate over billions or trillions of searches uh, per day, you've got to constantly make changes and you're not going to worry if you're Google about a particular industry. So mm -hmm. um, I remember there is a tax law uh, that was lobbied for um, in the last administration. And one of the things that we're going to get taxed, I believe at five or 10% was plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Some lobbyists went to Washington, some things changed and all of a sudden it ended up only on tanning salons and not on us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a win for some and a big loss for tanning salons. Right. And I think that I tend to agree. I think tanning probably causes cancer and plastic surgery probably does but there was that belief that it was aesthetic and unnecessary and because it was a luxury it mm -hmm. should be tax higher so there's winners and losers in a government mm -hmm. in any country and there's winners and losers online um, so getting to that despite that constant small changes um, think of it as little tiny tremors underneath the surface of California every year to about five years there's an earthquake online yep and uh, generally, we didn't have one for a few years, which is why a few years ago, all of these uh, web teams were doing things wrong. All these horrible results happened. All of these practices fired their web teams. All of them came running to us saying, what do we do? And we helped all of them get to the right teams. What's interesting is oftentimes, those big updates, earthquakes come rare. Yep. And when they come rare, it's nothing the web team did wrong. It just disproportionately affects certain web teams and their metrics and right. they have to change it. So let me stop there. What can I clarify for you? Because I'm about to dive in further. Great. Deeper. So what you're saying is, generally, there's a very competitive landscape, either locally but also grandly online, more mm -hmm. broadly. Uh, that landscape also shifts due to Google changing the algorithm to purportedly improve the search results. But those changes, even though there are constant changes along the way, the larger, more comprehensive changes can negatively affect certain websites to no fault of the web team. Correct. Great. Or to the practice or to anyone else for that matter, even to Google. Right. And so we're seeing that happen. The first one happened uh, in, I believe it was August, August 12th, or was it March of last year or August? I believe it was yeah. August last year, August of 2018. 18. Yep. And it was called the Google Medic Update. So uh, did specifically target <laughs> the medical industry. <laughs> and it disproportionately affected some medical websites. And uh, some actually were positively affected. There were some people who said, this is great. I'm now ranking, whereas once I was lost, now I'm found. Um, uh, that was actually Bill Gates who said that. Uh, but others were absolutely crushed and destroyed. And... There was nothing anyone really could have done about that. Um, they never tell you what they did. They never tell you exactly how to fix it. They may hint towards things like, we want more robust content on a page. Mm -hmm. Well, great, we're already trying to have robust content on the page. So right. you try some new video, you try some additional footage, you try, you try to change the keyword structure, you move some different things around, you change the map. There's a variety of things your web team can and should do, but they're simply reactive. And so one of our clients actually said, you know, John, when these things happen, I understand they happen. Why, why doesn't the web team act more quickly to fix it? And the reality is sometimes after an earthquake, you don't even know what storm hit your house. You mm -hmm. just don't even know what Google is suggesting be done. Right. So part of it is you have to wait and see, not because you're lazy or not because you don't want to jump on it, but it might take a week or two to get feedback from Google on what they did, to figure out best practices, to see where the rankings level out because there are the big earthquakes, there could be several smaller ones and little changes. 
So they don't even know what to do, let alone when to start doing it sometimes. Well, and I think part of the additional clarification is, is exactly how Google uh, manages the release of these updates, which is that it's not like they basically say, good news, guys, here's a two-week warning, here's all of the changes we're going to be making so you and can And if you're prepare. not following these rules, adjust before, exactly. you, before you're impacted. It literally happens... And then they usually issue some sort of press release, you know, on behalf of, uh, you know, to all web agencies saying, just so you know, we just made this update and here's why. It's how Ed manages me. He just backhands me across the face and he goes, now let me tell you what you did wrong. There it is. Powerful management. And then I say, how can I get better as an owner? And he says, hmm. No. I'll get back to you in a few weeks with some hints, but Let, I'll never tell you the let's truth. Let's just see how that love tap works out for you <laughs> first, okay? And that's kind of how Google does it because they basically say, here's the change. We're going to slap you with this big change and good luck. Exactly. So that's one of the challenges with the Google Medic update, with updates in general, is A, we don't know when they're going to happen. Now, we had a really good run, and one of the things that happened, which benefits us as SE oversight overseeing people's websites, and that we, we already, I think, do good work. Of course, we believe that we're biased, but we are, by definition, an oversight company that charges you know, less than one small procedure a year to oversee your entire web presence. So it's kind of hard for us not to be worth it. We don't tend to lose clients generally. Um, uh, but one of the reasons for that is we, is we do good work. But the second reason is quite honestly, most of our, our, our websites haven't run into a real painful thing in a while. Where right. They might blame us. They might blame the web team or they might blame their staff. Um, the second thing that's interesting about the most recent updates is there have been um, a tremor since. So yep. what do you call them? Aftershocks. That's yep. a better word. Yep. So since then, we normally would expect a massive shakeup like that, maybe yep. to be followed with a couple of minor little shifts or changes, a little here or there. Um, but we have then, since then, had at least two, if not three, additional giant earthquake-style shakeups yep. since then. One in March. Uh, of this year, March 12th, I think specifically. Yep. And Happy birthday, John Barry. <laughs> that's right. Well, <laughs> that's the 18th. But that's okay. Well, I wanted to make sure he was really in the weeds so he couldn't enjoy it all that day. Oh, that's yeah. Our, that's our VP. That's right. Yeah. yeah. He, he got some good. He's like, thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Google, couldn't you wait until the, uh, to the 20th? That's right. At least get, get me through my birthday towards the end of the mm. month. Uh, that kind of result straight bad. Yeah. So, uh, and then they actually did another one a few months later uh, to, and again, to sort of shift the course as they kind of monitor the results of uh, their, their, their previous uh, changes in the algorithm. Uh, so it's been a pretty volatile environment, uh, right. and it's affecting not only practices, but really any website that's related to medical in general, uh, the, associ uh, the associations and, um, you know, ASAPs, yeah. AFPRS, Real Self, for example, yeah. as well, has been heavily affected by this as well. Yeah. They've had to make some changes, so it's, it's pretty yeah. I believe every major site has. Been. So, for example, we had one of our clients that uh, relied heavily, actually two or three of our clients who, uh, you know, one in New York, one in the state of Texas, I think one in California as well, um, that uh, relied heavily on blog traffic. Um, now, blog traffic doesn't buy as much. It doesn't convert as well. It can sometimes obfuscate how poorly or how well your website's really doing. But it adds visitors and it certainly doesn't harm anything. And overnight, a lot of that blog traffic disappears. Now, that's very scary at first. But what was interesting is we found that well, with one of our clients, when the blog traffic decreased by 80 90 percent of their blog traffic went down um, their conversion percentage the percentage of people who were visiting the site that called or emailed became leads became patients yep. uh, went up 800 percent so we didn't see a real net loss or at least not much of one we still weren't happy about the update would have rather had the visitors we still are working hard to make things even better it's gonna be a top priority probably for the next year to do everything we can to make them bigger and better than they ever were yep uh, but it didn't necessarily affect sales but it's still a scary thing to go through uh, we had another client who actually uh, had the same thing happen but their overall lead counts are up 20 or 30 percent because they're getting really high quality traffic so we're noticing a lot of the national sites with national rankings mm -hmm. whether you're a Yelp or something way bigger than we'll ever be, right. uh, or any of you listening will ever be, or whether it's a local doctor relying on a lot of national blogs. They like, let's say they do a ton of uh, revision facelifting, or revision vag vaginal rejuvenation, or revision tummy tucks, or revision uh, dermatology, or sure. very advanced cancers, or any any really risky or scary or I'm willing to travel kind of stuff where you might actually be searching nationally and not just for best doctor in Nashville. Right. Um, they're losing some of the traffic because Google's pushing more locally, yep. which theoretically is good for your ice cream shop and your steakhouse and your furniture store and a million other things. In fact, most things. Uh, but it can hurt, say, a national consultancy right. uh, or other things that have nationally uh, based rankings. Now, there's a lot more to it, but that's one of the trends. So the trend currently is that there's volatility in the market. The question is, well, great, John. Thanks for telling me I'm screwed. What should we do now? 
Um, you got options. One of the things that we find again is that doctors in general, most practicing generals are, are reactive. By nature, you go to school for 33 years. A, right. you're brilliant. Sure. B, you go for 33 years of schooling and training to fix people. So yep. as soon as anything goes wrong, you're like, what medicine works? What do I cut? What do I stitch? What do I do? How do I heal? And you want to change the same way we always preach that when you have a day of bad, no, bad uh, show percentage, don't change your plan. Right. Just Admit it's raining outside. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you know, and now if you see three months in a row of bad show percentage, make a change. Of course. So the first thing we recommend is don't react. What I would look back at is your organic, unique visitors dating back 18 to 24 months. If that overall trend looks like the stock market, a jagged line but generally going up, mm -hmm. you're probably okay. Give it a little bit of time. Now get on your web team. Right. Call them up. Let them know about the updates. Make sure they did something. We had another client in California, not a client of ours in California. He's a yellow telescope client that doesn't use SE Oversight. Um, at least not yet, um, but he used um, another team and the team basically uh, got affected by Google Medic Update. Can't really blame that team, even though we know that team doesn't do necessarily the best work. Since then, almost 12 months later, no changes. Right. And they didn't mention it to him that it occurred. Right. So if I'm a web agency, I'm going directly to Mr. Searing and say, Mr. Searing, this is what occurred. It was not our fault, which doesn't, not a matter of blame, but just, you know, it's not our fault. But here's what we're doing, even if that's nothing for two weeks to watch. Yep. But here's what we'll be doing over the next three or four months to do everything possible under the sky to fix it over time, even though it's not our fault, but it's our job to fix it. You know, I say sometimes things aren't your fault, but it's still your job to fix it. Right. And I think that, you know, when we look Parenthood. at- Parenthood. That's right. When we look at uh, good teams versus less than good teams, particularly within in the digital marketing industry, um, what we notice uh, is that some of the faults aren't necessarily in the performance, but often it's the communication. Right. And so we find ourselves through SE Oversight managing not just the client's expectations, but also the team to actually get right. on them and say, by the way, if you haven't reached out to Dr. Smith, please do so immediately, right. very proactively, particularly because they're going to be sitting wondering. And we want them to, to know about things from us instead of learning about it later or looking at some That's change exactly in their right. Because web agencies did not go into web agencing to be responsive. They're notoriously right. bad. And doctors didn't go into being a doctor to be great at marketing. So our job is sometimes to talk both sides off the ledge, right. make the web agency do their job, and ensure the doctor doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So it is possible your team's terrible. That, that happens. Sure. Uh, maybe we're selling against ourselves to encourage you to give them a little bit of time. But if you are out there and the team has done well up to this point, don't worry too much if there's been an update. But A, contact them. Let them know you're, you're aware of the updates. B, have them send you a specific and written game plan on what they're going to be doing over the course of, say, 90 days. Then have them at least give you broad ranges of where they expect to be. Maybe they can't guarantee a number of leads or visitors, nor should they, but they should be able to tell you where they expect things to be within a range over you know 90 to 120 days, something like that. Right. So that's one trend we're seeing is volatility online. We expect that to tamp down over the next six months a bit, mm -hmm. continue to push more local. Yep. Um, and then hopefully there'll be another nice steady rise in terms of that. We are noticing a second trend that certainly plastic surgery, services, aesthetics, dermatology, all these things, skin care, lotions, potions, and everything else are growing. But I do believe personally that we have hit a peak in terms of machinery. Yep. There will always be more things coming out. There was a point when I entered the industry that most doctors I worked with, as I pour the beautiful stag. Lovely. Most doctors that I worked with really weren't very hot on anything like a machine, yeah, uh, lasers, phasers, and so on. Well, it was a little bit of distrust, a little bit of you know snake oil, sort of you know the because reps most of it quite simply and, didn't work. They right. weren't wrong. Most of it was kind of voodoo. It just didn't really work that great. It had nominal, and they said, "I'm a surgeon. I'm going to do surgery, right? Um, or I'm a dermatologist. I'm going to cut this out, or I'm going to fix it with something stronger." Right. There's a couple things out there. Your CO2s back in the day, your yeah. phenol peels, that sort of thing. But it just wasn't much for skin or, or non-invasive. Fast forward today. Uh, I was kind of a disbeliever for a while, and then it's gotten to the point where I'm like, wow, there's a lot of really good products, really good machines. The, the technology has improved, so whether you want to zap your stomach with sit-ups, or whether you want to have your skin resurfaced, or whether you want to have a minimally invasive treatment to get rid of fat on the body. Sure. You know, these sorts of things have really grown, but we are also seeing that there's more and more in the market that doesn't work that great, and mm -hmm. for every one of those machines, there's about a three-month or six-month grace period where they go to the tastemakers of the industry and fly them to the Bahamas and introduce the new product and get them sold on it, and then they open it up to every single other person in the community, mm -hmm. um, and everyone buys it, and it slowly just sort of drops off, and then they become competitors, competitors, competitors. I don't sense over the next three years there's going to be anything massively new and amazing and interesting under the sun. Um, Allergan just sold. Right. Um, 
and their you know the stocks have been been struggling for a variety of reasons. Even though I believe very much in almost all allergen products, right? Uh, but there's just more and more competition and so forth. So my personal opinion is the second trend that I'm really trying to lead and work with my doctors on is stop buying a lot of stuff. Yep. Save it for the inevitable recession that is coming and invest through the recession. Now the recession may be three years away before it starts, or it may be tomorrow. But take that money put it in the bank or take that money and better yet and invest it in marketing, invest it in pay-per-click marketing, invest it in social media marketing, invest it in SEO, mm -hmm. invest it in local marketing of some sort, even if that's radio or TV, but invest it or save it because you're going to want to build a juggernaut of marketing because you need the leads. Remember I started off by saying there's been a trend that people are tapering off leads. More doctors who've been around 20 years are not getting enough leads to keep their surgery schedule full. Yep. So whether you like it or not, you have to invest in marketing. And zero people are not gonna buy a whatever machine. Right. No matter how nice the machine is, if you have zero people calling, they don't buy it. So you need more people calling more than you need more machinery. Yep. Doctors, you have enough out there you can offer to hit most things that people are gonna need. So we want to invest, 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 and save because I believe there's a canary in the coal mine. Yep, I like to call it the machine of dreams. If you buy it, they will come just sort of magically. And that's what some of the reps will actually tell you. And of course, they include a lot of the marketing dollars to help you support it, get the leads. A hundred percent of the time, whatever they're telling you the marketing budget is for that machine, it is probably short by about 90%. Our sort of golden rule is that whatever you're going to spend on any new technology, plan to spend 2x on the marketing right. uh, specifically to get that off the ground over a period of say the first year within, within to try to get that off the ground. Now, of course, that said, to your point, save the money currently and it, the, the time to maybe invest in some of that new technology is when your current services, treatments, uh, and providers are all completely maxed out. You cannot get an appointment for a treatment within at least eight weeks. And then of course the rule is just raise prices because the, the people have spoken and the supply and demand law says they're willing to pay more if they're willing to right. wait uh, before you can continue to invest. And then when there is a recession, it's going to make it that much more important that you have that marketing uh, foundation and also you've got the right staff and the right people. I mean, my goodness, we were managing practices back in 2008, 2009, and when, as soon as the recession hit, first year, even. Didn't, right. didn't actually drop uh, compared to the year prior. So then, practice had 1,500 leads to follow up with. Exactly. Everybody. And we had five patient care coordinators managing those. Yeah, and that 1,500 dropped all the way down to like 1,200. So then we were only booked out two months. Yeah, exactly. And so then, of course, uh, we were not only able to ride out the recession, but we actually grew by seven figures the second year of the recession. And of course, people talk about how it was you know, the longest uh, turnaround from a recession. And now we're into the, uh, uh, the longest strong period, as you mentioned, of course, in e economic history. Of course, that is going to dip at some point, and of course, we don't know when or how, how far, but when that happens, it makes it that much more important to have the infrastructure to invest in that now versus new technology. I think extremely well said, and we literally saw it last time where a lot of doctors said, I'm going out of business, I'm going out of business, I've dropped 40%, and because we were able to, even able to stay even, our thought, honestly, from a capitalistic standpoint was we're sad to see it go, but you know maybe now is the time to retire, and then we scoop all of that back up on the way up. Uh, we see it in consulting as well. I've never really seen any new consulting groups really open during my tenure as Yellow Telescope since 08. Yeah. There's a couple, three lone wolves, and a couple people with two or three people doing consulting, and probably some of them do, do a nice job, have different areas of expertise, and you know there's plenty of room for all of us, in my opinion. Um, the last year I've seen at least 10 or 15 new individuals who have suddenly said that they are consulting experts in the aesthetic industry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Probably some of them are good and probably some are not. Depending on how they manage their business over the next two or three years, we'll see if they go the way of the dinosaur as well. So even though I hate recessions, I don't want things to dip. Certainly. I'm ready to welcome one because it's a nice cleansing so the cream rises to the top. That's right. And similarly, there are doctors who laugh all the way to the bank by purchasing every new machine. Sure. But they laugh all the way to the bank because they watch their friends buy one machine or two machines and they don't have the marketing juggernaut to support it. What they don't share is how they get the word out. They don't share that they have six other doctors supporting it. They don't share that they were lucky enough to open their website in 1994 and because of that they ranked number one in all of Los Angeles or all of Seattle or all of wherever for that particular term. So they're getting 106 leads a month from it while the other person doesn't rank at all. So the trend uh, for doctors is spending more and more and more on technology because there's simply more options. 
um, and spending less and less and less on marketing and being fearful and worry, worried about it, largely due to bad teams, which we've been solving you know, for six years now, I think, since SE Oversight got rolling. Right. And then secondarily, due to things outside their control that they're blaming on teams like Google updates and changes to the way people purchase. That, I think, leads to the last general trend. Um, which is in addition to having to reinvest. So in other words, let's take the $67,000 you were going to spend on XYZ machine and you gave that to me to market your business. Mm -hmm. Let's just say we just did that. We charged nothing to do it. Let's just say I'm going to generate more leads than your machine is. Yep. And I'll generate them for something you already have that you don't have to buy a $67,000 machine. So I'm not saying never purchase one. I'm not saying there's never a time to invest in new technology. But whenever you think that time is, wait three years and then buy it. Right. Because there will be something new. There will be another end of quarter or fiscal year end special or whatever they're selling. Um, and that may not be true in terms of hiring, training, and managing great people. That may not be true in terms of investing early and often in proper technology, which leads to that last trend, which is where to then additionally invest. So if you've got a good web team with good SEO and you're ranking pretty well and they're fixing whatever goods or bads came with the recent updates over the last year, the last thing we're absolutely seeing trending is the investment in uh, more Google AdWords and pay-per-click marketing. Uh, it really works in most markets most of the time for most doctors, not all doctors all the time in all markets. If and, managed well. Correct. And it very much is a campaign. That's what they call it, a campaign. There needs to be constant A-B testing on specific wording as far as the ads are concerned, uh, what sort of results, click-through rates, and cost per acquisition that we're seeing. That needs to be monitored over several months, even at the start. But assuming that's being done, you've got the, the, the talent and the, the right team to oversee that, uh, we are seeing a lot of success partially due to the, the algorithmic changes that Google's been making and actually to strengthen that, which of course they say is consumer behavior. Of course, we also know that they're a multi-billion dollar corporation and want to make a lot more money through us paying them to get rankings. Absolutely. I mean, in fact, some of our very top web agencies are beyond Google partners. Uh, it's the next level up and uh, we have two or three that we work with that are uh, uh, certified premier, which means they actually have their own rep from Google that works with them on occasion. And why do they do that? Well, it's not really because Google wants to teach and coach and give them hugs and kisses and help support them as a wonderful company. It's that they want to figure out how to get those agencies to sell you more pay-per-click. And one of the ways they do that, which is noble, is actually teaching them how to do better pay-per-click marketing. So I would love to be sold more marketing that was effective. Right. I personally, for my industry, I invest in booths at almost every conference. I invest in different materials and bags. I sponsor things. I have swag that I put out. Um, we do mailings. We have a different things we do because we're not really an SEO friendly business. Not a lot of people Google best medical aesthetic consulting company near me. Right. Uh, and with the new update, I wouldn't show up anyway unless you live in Miami. Right. Even though our clientele span, span North America. So there's big investment in that. And the last thing I want to touch on um, is in social media paid advertising. So I think at this point, we've seen a, a last trend that doctors are more social savvy. Yep. Which means they're still all basically terrible, but they're at least investing in and having someone post some stuff. And then there's a small 10% at the top, which all of you are a part of. All of you listening are really good. Um, and and they're, they're creating beautiful content. They've got a team internally. They've got a couple of superstars. They're investing $150,000 a year in staffing just for social media um, and uh, so forth. So we're seeing that trend um, that people are investing in organic, but they're not investing in paid ads. We are seeing great success with doing sponsored ads, meaning paid ads on Instagram and Facebook, for example, or LinkedIn, to yep. some extent Twitter. Um, promoting events. Yep. So if you're having an event to launch that new machine you shouldn't have bought, yep. uh, or maybe you should have, or if you're investing, uh, you're having an event just to promote something you already have, a non-invasive event while you're on vacation or meet the doctor and have consults about aging face or whatever it is that, that you're doing, we're having significant results. We had a client in New Jersey, got, I believe it was over 80 RSVPs, over 50 people to show up, and I think over 42 people quoted. And we're waiting, I think, on the final dollar value. Heck, even if they got two sales out of it, I mean, they're doing great with, with the amount of money we spent, which I think was 500 bucks or something. Yeah. Uh, and if they got 20 or 30 or 40, knowing how good that team is, you know, who knows what the profit margin is. Uh, further, promoting new technologies, promoting lesser known technologies, promoting what we call um, uh, 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 
lonely procedures. That's yep. the word. Things like a gynecomastia where maybe a man doesn't want to share with his friends. He's unhappy and wants that fixed. Or, um, you know, uh, women who are having incontinence issues who may not necessarily talk with their friends about that. Promoting these things through social media has really been effective. Now, it's not a home run on every campaign, no. but it is a real lead generator. And we've seen the vast majority of our clients at Ice Cream Social Media monetize and be successful with it. But it's an additive, small, additional investment. We're talking... 500 bucks to a couple grand a month invested in the ads yep. for a 90 to 120 day run. Try a few campaigns, see which ones work, reinvest in the ones that, that do, get rid of the ones that don't. So it's a modest downside, a few thousand bucks, and a fairly significant update, uh, uh, upside, upside mm-hmm. 5, 10, 15, 20, 30. We're even doing this for insurance based surgeries for doctors that um, uh, take out of network or have uh, their own OR and can bill very, very large numbers. We can literally target very, very specific things. So yeah. um, as I go on, let me get off the train and speaking let of you being a wash in leads, could you pass me that water? Mm-hmm. That would be great. This really is delicious, really just needs a touch. Um, to really open that up more. Well done. Well done. Thank you, sir. It's um, good. Of course, when we speak about the, the, the paid social media campaigns as well, there are going to be similarities in the philosophy to the testing to make sure we are getting a successful campaign and we are actually able to monetize it, which needs to be very comprehensive, not only just about uh, the particular spend and the management uh, from a day-to-day standpoint, uh, as well as uh, the management of uh, the leads, but also when they come in, we're actually following up specifically with the salespeople uh, within the office to make sure that we're tracking uh, the the actual conversion, not only to consultation, Get but also to funnel, the procedure, yeah. right? Narrow, narrow the funnel all the way down. Furthermore, um, it, it really does need to be very, very different, even though there are some of those uh, similar philosophies when it comes to the A-B testing and the nature of the ad, due to the nature of Facebook and Instagram and the, the sheer number of variables that you're able to select uh, it, it really makes it much more complicated in a lot of ways from, a, from an A-B testing standpoint because if we're targeting a specific demographic, gender, uh, zip code, uh, level of income, uh, professional uh, affiliation, whatever the, the, the variables are. Installing might be. a specific pixel on your website that machine learns and is using artificial intelligence to improve it. You change one thing and you have to start your whole pixel over. Exactly. Things beyond what anyone would think are as simple as just picking. 30 to 55 year old women. Right. And of course, you know, we do, you know, talk to uh, plenty of practices and businesses that say, oh yeah, no, I'm kind of dabbling with that a little bit, just the same way they might have, you know, an intern come in for 10 hours a week to like post some posts to social media, which they think is going to help their organic rankings because, you know, they're a millennial, which of course we right. know they can't do for, 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 for any uh, level professionally. Uh, furthermore, they might just say, yeah, you know, I just sort of turned on an ad and sort of paid some money and kind of went into, you know, Facebook. Oh, and it didn't work. It didn't work. Yeah, it's funny. Facebook advertising doesn't work that's because how I, I tried it myself. That's how I do surgery. I, just, I went in, I did, I did my best. Right. It seemed pretty intuitive. I mean, they live. Pull the so. skin back. Success. Pull the, remove the fat, pull the skin back. So it really does need to be done professionally. Uh, and again, we're not talking about massive investments. And, you know, of course, we you know, always talk about our marketing ladder. Of course, once you've got your site, you've got your SEO, and you've got, uh, you know, things actually sort of humming along those lines. That's when you can really start looking at some of the more of the paid ads, the pay-per-click for, through Google and, of course, through Facebook and Instagram. But it needs to be an and this, and this, and this. Don't say shut off your SEO and then actually just funnel all that money into the paid advertising. Find other areas that might be loss leaders or cost centers, as we call them, and put them into the profit center. Center, um, of the paid advertising. I love it. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to have to get out of here. I know. Got to pick up the kid from soccer, so. That's right. Yeah. So a couple of parting shots. Number one, uh, the Yellow Telescope Seminar is coming up. Uh, we have already outsold last year. It's just a few months away. If you have any last minute interest in joining, please get in touch at info at yellowtelescope.com or give us a buzz. We'll be speaking before that at AAFPRS, the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. If you don't know what that is, then you won't be there. Uh, we'll also be speaking at... ASPS, the ASPS American Society Assembly. of Plastic Surgeons. We've got three booths there. We'll have a whole row. It's going to be exciting. Ice Cream Social Media and SE Oversight and Yellow Telescope will all be there. Uh, we have a new edition of the team joining us, which is exciting. We continue to grow. That's right. Um, we haven't gotten our ranking, but for the third, third year in a row, we should know by our next podcast, we have been announced as South Florida Business Journal's Fast 50. That's right. The 50 fastest growing companies in the South Florida of three years in a row. Last year we were number seven, two years ago we were number 15. We'll see what we are for the third year. Um, we'll also be speaking immediately after our meeting at the Global Aesthetics Conference. Yep, right we'll in our there hometown. as well. So uh, come, come see us if you're going to be at the Lowe's. Get se- several talks and uh, panels. I'm um, actually speaking largely about social media. 
Yep, we're going big on social, so uh, it's the way of the future. So come check us out. Uh, appreciate you tuning in, listening in, joining us in the Hamptoons. Enjoy the rest of your summer. We certainly will. And uh, we'll see you in the fall. Or sooner. Play us out. Joe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>